W. Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and we're celebrating with you today the sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time. And for us, as a parish named Our Lady of Lourdes, we're also celebrating her feast day. Let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let's begin Mass, as always, by looking into our hearts and confessing our sins. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, her Virgin, all of the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father, amen. And so we pray. Lord God, give to your people the joy of continued health in mind and body and soul. And with the prayers of the Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Lourdes, help us, guide us through the sorrows of this life to eternal happiness in the life to come. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, If someone has on his skin a scab or pustule or blotch, which appears to be the sore of leprosy, he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of the priests among his descendants. If the man is leprous and unclean, the priest shall declare him unclean by reason of the sore on his head. The one who bears the sore of leprosy shall keep his garments rent and his head bare, and shall muffle his beard. He shall cry out, Unclean! Unclean! As long as the sore is on him, he shall declare himself unclean, since he is in fact unclean. He shall dwell apart, making his abode outside the camp. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. 
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Avoid giving offense, whether to the Jews or Greeks or the Church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in every way, not seeking my own benefit, but that of the many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. A leper came to Jesus and kneeling down begged him and said, If you wish, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said to him, I do will it be made clean. The leprosy left him immediately, and he was made clean. Then, warning him sternly, Jesus dismissed him at once. He said to him, See that you tell no one anything, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses prescribed. That will be proof for them. The man went away and began to publicize the whole matter. He spread the report abroad so that it was impossible for Jesus to enter a town openly. He remained outside in deserted places, and people kept coming to him, from everywhere. And this is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. We have lots to do today. Grateful that you're here with us. Let's talk about these readings. We're celebrating, as I mentioned, also the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, our patroness feast here at Our Lady of Lourdes in beautiful Massapequa Park, New York. Also, of course, it's Valentine's Day, so there's lots to celebrate today. Thank you for being with us. First of all, let's go to Leviticus. That whole story of the lepers... Um, and what's going on in terms of uh, their dealing with their illness is reflective of a prejudice that existed in Old Testament times. And the prejudice was this. If you are carrying severe illness or a terrible burden or a tragic circumstance like leprosy, it must be because you were a terrible sinner. And this is God's payback. Leprosy was viewed as God's judgment against you. And you could listen to that and think, this is crazy, right? But it's not so unusual. It's, in fact, to some extent or another, even existing in our own time. In my own lifetime, I remember once when a child was born with severe disability, that a priest had said, well, there must be some sin in that family's past that caused this to happen. I remember saying, Father, you're out of your mind. We don't believe that. You can't believe that and be a follower of Jesus Christ. But certainly in Leviticus, reflecting Old Testament values, the only way to explain the horror that was leprosy and the burden those people carried was it must be payback for either the sin of the leper or someone in their family who went before them. And I think to some extent, believe it or not, there's still some of that now, that we still believe to some extent that uh, God works that way, that he pays back for our sins, that he's looking to zap us in some way for the things we do wrong. I'm reminded, don't we all go through this experience of uh, somebody says something nasty to you in the house, and then they open a kitchen cabinet and it hits them in the head, see, God's getting you back for what you did. We've all gone through that experience where we say, you know, we're going to have to be atoneful 
for what we've done, and God's going to get us back in some way to punish us. Many, many times I find that when people have horrible things happening to them, they're very quick to decide it must be God's judgment. And as we're going to see as we go into the New Testament, I don't know what God they're talking about, but it's not our God. Our God doesn't work that way. Leprosy or the burden of illness is no one's payback for previous sin. Quite the opposite. We have a God who longs to forgive our sin and never wants us to be burdened by the pain and suffering that is part of our world we very often endure. Let's go to that second reading, St. Paul to the Corinthians. The key here is be imitators of Christ. You know, when people ask me, I want to be a good Catholic, I want to be a good Christian, what am I supposed to do? I don't think it's all that complicated. Thomas Kempis, in his book, Imitation of Christ, goes into it in great detail how we might live as imitators of Christ. If you want to be someone who's saved, just look at the man. I'm telling you those bracelets that many kids still wear to this day, WWJD. What would Jesus do is a great way to live our lives. If you're not sure, you find you go to him. What's his example? What did he do in the circumstance? And you're almost always going to do the right thing. You know, if you're inclined to judge or condemn others or to see other people as evil and decide you want no part of them, you look to Jesus who's embracing people left and right. When you're inclined to judge other people harshly, you look at the Jesus who had the woman caught in adultery and said, him, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. How simple it would be in our lives if we could just simplify and say, if in this circumstance Jesus was in my shoes, what would he do? And we're always then going to do the right thing. We only get into trouble, I think, when we go off in a different direction, when we don't do what he would do, when we don't choose to follow the path that Jesus followed. We're called on to emulate him. We're called on to be imitators of Christ. I've shared with you before that one of the guests on the Personally Speaking show that I host some years ago was Stephen Schwartz, who had written a lot of musicals, including Wicked and Pippin. But the other thing that mystified me is why, as a secular Jewish man, his first musical was Godspell and about the life of Jesus. And I said, why would you, as a secular Jew, write about Jesus and compose music about Jesus? As he said, you don't have to be Christian to know the world would be in much better shape if we actually lived by the teachings of Jesus. And then he stuck in a little knife into Christians, and he wasn't entirely wrong when he said, you know, some Christian churches should try living like Jesus did. And he was onto something there, that if we live like him, we'd be in such better shape. I often think of that when we get into these great debates now, you know, conservative versus liberal in the church about communion. You know, should people who are divorced and remarried receive communion? Who deserves to receive communion? And then I think to myself, all right, I'm going with the man. What would Jesus do? What's happening at the Last Supper? He invites the 12. They're sinners. They're weak. They're cowardly. They're stupid. They're going to deny him in short order. They're going to run from him when he really needs them. Did he not know the character of the men in that room? Sure he did. Did he invite them to the Eucharist? Yes, he did. Did he invite even Judas to that meal? Yes, he did. So when we play the politics of communion in our church sometimes, who's good enough, who's not good enough, I think to myself, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the man. I'm going to decide, leave it up to Jesus. Jesus, is there anyone you don't want at this table? Is there anyone you're refusing to share your body and blood with? Did you not know those apostles were massive sinners and yet you invite them to be the first people invited to the first Eucharist ever? What would Jesus do? Be imitators of Christ and we'll be living the life we're supposed to. What would he do? And then if you and I live that way, we can be certain we're not going to get into much trouble. Okay, let's finally go to the Gospel of Mark. So Jesus sees this leper, and here's the line I love the most. He was moved with pity. When you're inclined, maybe by virtue of the background that we got in some of our earlier Catholic education, to decide that Jesus is mostly a judge who's looking to condemn us or in some way send us on the down escalator, would you keep that simple phrase in mind? Jesus sees your suffering, your sin, and mine, and he's moved with pity. Moved with pity translated just means he's filled with compassion. He's filled with mercy. He longs for us to be whole. He saw this leper, who in his time, by the way, would have been viewed as a major sinner who somehow or another was carrying the guilt that either his sin demanded or someone in his family had committed the sin that had to be punished. Jesus, knowing that, knowing what Jewish people back then thought about people who had leprosy, was moved with pity. He didn't care how it happened. He just cared that this person shouldn't suffer. And he knew that he could relieve that suffering, and that's all he cared about doing. Isn't it great to know that you and I have a God 
who looks at us at our worst and says, I long because I'm moved with mercy, love, compassion, and pity. I'm moved to heal you. I want you whole. You know, uh, there's a great book by Nizo, Nico Kazantzakis, who wrote, of course, Zorba the Greek, but it's another book of his not so famous. It's called St. Francis. And St. Francis, uh, in the book, has a great ability to love people and be kind to people and be generous to people, but he's got one clay foot, and that's when he sees a leper, it causes him to be so overwhelmed by fear that he can't even take the next step. And he recognizes that he can never be an imitator of Christ unless he can overcome that fear and see his leprous brother or sister as a true member of the family, as someone worthy of love in the same way he shares love with everyone else. And so in Cousin Zacchaeus' book, St. Francis, he sees a leper coming, for a moment he freezes, and then he realizes, what would Jesus do? How am I to be an imitator of Christ? And he goes toward his greatest fear, that leper, he embraces him, and kisses him, and in that moment, the leper disappears. I think Pope Francis did something similar. You may remember that powerful picture early on in his pontificate. There was a man with severe deformity. Most people would cringe at the sight, but the Holy Father chose differently to go up, embrace, and to kiss that man on that side of his face which was most deformed, most defective. And I think it was Pope Francis' way of echoing St. Francis of Assisi and echoing our Lord Jesus in recognizing our response to those in pain must be mercy, must be love and compassion to make them whole. We are called on by Jesus to be moved with pity whenever we see suffering, and not just to be moved by pity. You know, lots of people say, I have great pity for that person, but then the key to move from a a distant, I'm sorry for you, to an up-close and personal Let me do for you. Let me love you in action, not just in my heart. And that's what Jesus does. He actually brings about a cure. He actually brings about wholeness to that leper. But now there's a second part of that gospel I want to focus on because I love it. The man was told by Jesus, imagine this guy just cured you and he gives you an order. Don't tell anyone what I did. Why is that? Jesus didn't want people just seeing him as some kind of miracle performer. He wanted a a transformation of their faith. He wanted them to believe in him, not just to say, well, he does miracles, so he must be somebody special. And so Jesus says, you keep quiet now. You don't tell anyone. And then we're told, I love it, the man went away and began to publicize the whole matter. He couldn't keep quiet. Why? I think we can understand why. Imagine you've been rejected by everyone in society, viewed as a major sinner, deserving of your leprous condition. And this Jesus comes along and he makes you whole. He, he gives you the freedom from illness. He helps you to be recognizing that you are a child of God and loved by God. What a wonderful thing. And so you can't keep quiet. And what I'm going to suggest is that you and I in some ways walk in the shoes of that leper. If we really believe that we've been touched by Jesus, that our lives are enriched by his presence in our lives, that we're better people because we know and love him, and he knows and loves us, why are we quiet about it? You know, when people say, well, I'm kind of private about my faith. You know, I interview lots of people, and they'll say, well, I'm a believer in Jesus, and I I go to church, but I don't want the whole world to know that. I don't try to force my views on anyone else. You don't have to force them on anyone else, but you don't have to be shy and inhibited about the fact that you belong to Jesus. I'm thrilled that somewhere along the line in my family history, Christianity and Catholicism was brought to bear. And so early on, I was given my faith, one of the greatest gifts my parents and my family could ever give me. And I'm so delighted to belong to Jesus and to be his priest. And I'm not going to be quiet about that. I've shared a little bit of this with you before, but, you know, I told you there's a woman who sought me out. I had placed her for adoption 25 years ago, and she waited at my church back in St. Thomas in West Hempstead to tell me that I had placed her with an adoptive family, and she wanted to thank me for convincing her mom not to have an abortion and to place her for adoption. And she said that powerful line that certainly uh, I carry in my heart. She said, Monsignor Jim, thank you for my life. A beautiful and powerful thing to say. But I said to her, you know, when you speak up on the right to life, 
you're going to get beat up sometimes. And I have to tell you, lots of people wish I would just shut up and say nothing about this issue. It's too controversial. It's too sensitive. It's not politically correct. And I said, I got to tell you, I said to this young girl, I I'm glad that it worked out for us with you. But I said, I get a lot of grief for speaking about the pro-life cause. And she said, well, if I'm an example of what happens when you speak up, I hope, Monsignor Jim, you never shut up. And so I never will. And I think in the same way, just as that leper who'd been healed by Jesus could not be quiet, we're called on the same way to be people who are delighted that we belong to Jesus, grateful, grateful, grateful that he has transformed our lives and are unwilling to be shy or reticent or unwilling to tell the world, I belong to Jesus. If you don't like it, sorry, this is who I am and delighted to be. Okay, two other things I wanted to talk about today. One is the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, and the second is about Valentine's Day. First of all, I love this. This is a statue we keep in the rectory. This is, of course, an image of St. Bernadette when she met Our Lady in Lourdes in France. And uh, what's this day got to teach us? Well, many, many things, because we could talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus, in a million different ways, the Immaculate Conception. But I want to talk a little bit more about Bernadette. Not very well educated at all. A peasant viewed by most in society as someone kind of below everybody else. And it reminded me, my best friend in the priesthood was Father Joe Lukaszewski, uh, died 20 years ago. But the holy card for his ordination, you know, you can pick any kind of passage, but he took one from St. Paul in the Corinthians. And listen to what it says. God chose what the world considers absurd to shame the wise. He singled out the weak of this world to shame the strong. That's the very definition of St. Bernadette. Nobody would have put her up on high, simple, not educated, poor, a peasant. And yet, God, through his blessed mother, used this woman to give us a divine and wonderful message. And it reminds me sometimes when we get highfalutin about theology and about the things of God, that he sometimes speaks to us in the simplest ways and through what the world perceives to be the simplest people. Because God's message is not all that complex. Love one another. Be filled with mercy. Be moved with pity. You don't need a doctorate to know what that means. Be kind to one another. Live as did St. Bernadette, with a richness of faith and a willingness to believe. And know it doesn't matter where you come from, what your education is, what you have in your pocket, what kind of house you live in, what kind of car you drive. He loves you amazingly. And he uses the simple and the powerless to teach the people who think they're pretty bright and think they're pretty powerful to teach them the true and real meaning of life and love. Okay, that's one thing I wanted to say about Bernard. That then about St. Valentine... You know, this is considered a feast of love. So here's what I thought I would do by way of ending the homily. If you happen to be watching this Mass, and maybe, just maybe, you're blessed to be sitting in the presence of your husband or wife, why don't we kind of renew those vows, you know? Every time we get blessed and renew our vows, it's a good thing. And if you're not married to the person you're living with, well, maybe you'll just use this opportunity as a chance to tell the people in your life who you love that you love them. We, we feel it, but very often we don't get to say it. But if you happen to be with your spouse, this is a great time to get renewed. So I want you to get right next to each other, hold each other's hands. When you get married, we ask you three questions. I'm going to ask you those questions now, and if you're with your spouse, I'd like you to answer them in the affirmative by saying yes. The first question is, in choosing each other, did you do it freely? Would you do it again? And will you commit yourselves to giving to each other fully and completely? If so, say yes. The second question, do you promise before God that you will forever love, honor, and respect each other as husband and wife? If so, say yes. And thirdly, if God has blessed you with the miracle of children or grandchildren, do you promise to love them unconditionally and by your example teach them the love and goodness of Jesus Christ? If so, Say yes. And now, husbands, holding the hand of your wife, I want you to repeat after me. I take you once again to be my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you 
and honor you all the days of my life. And now wives, looking right into the eyes of your husband, I take you once again to be my husband. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. You've once again declared your consent before God and God's people. May the Lord in his goodness strengthen your consent and fill you both with his blessings. What God has today again joined together, mankind must never divide. And to that, let's all say aloud and clear, Amen. Amen. And for those of you who are just sitting with people you love, while I head back to the altar, this is a great time to turn to them and say, I don't say it enough, but you mean the world to me. I love you very much. Thank you for being part of my life. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now with confidence in God's goodness, his love for us, his mercy, his tendency to be moved with pity at our suffering, Let's present to him our prayers of petition. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. That the church may be an instrument of God's mercy through her mission and outreach to those most in need. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. That world and local leaders may seek the poor and forsaken, giving them the dignity and assistance they deserve as children of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. That church leaders may bear witness to God's gift and plan for marriage and assist couples to live that vocation faithfully. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our, our prayer. prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Corinne Locke, Anne-Marie Tenay, Amy and Len Madelon, Lenny Madelon, John Madelon, Andrew Madelon, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Felice Murali, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intention of this Mass, Rani Cacioppo, Alice Haroon, Suzanne Scanio, whom we remember at this Eucharist, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let me add some prayers for those who are sick. You heard us mention our retired parish outreach coordinator, Corinne Locke. I had the privilege of visiting with her and her family this week. Corinne is coming to the end of her earthly journey. And uh, after all the good she did, I'm convinced that she will quickly return to God in heaven. But we pray for her and her family and for their continued consolation. Let me pray among the sick for Barbara Turley, for Joseph Frischia, for baby Emily Quart a preemie who's doing better, for Frank Kilgannon, Barbara Truglio, Dorothy DeLisa and Mary Littress, for Thomas Lauer, and for Carrie McCormick, for all those who are battling addictions of any kind. I pray too for Kevin Shields, who underwent brain surgery, for Michael Cataldi and George Gill. I pray for Michael Cardone, for Charlene Eisencraft, for Noah Torelli, for Don and Jean Azevedo, I pray for Lori Lishan, for Georgie Ritter, Al Clemente, Gary Hudson, for Jean Lucich Dwyer. I pray for Laura Elizabeth Steele 
and Megan and Vinnie Mercadiano. and Vinny Mercadiano. I pray for Anthony Posterino and Frank Rosado. I pray as well for Tom O'Sullivan. Frank said I don't have to pray for him anymore because he's doing better since his heart attack, and we're happy about that. Frank, I'll take you off the list next week, I promise. I pray for my friend Vern. I want to pray for my friend Madeline. I visited with Madeline this week. I loved her. She's uh, 85 and battling cancer, but she was telling me time and time again, I've had such a wonderful life. If it's time, I'm okay. I love seeing people who have that disposition, grateful for the life they've lived and looking forward to the life to come. Let me pray too as well for Henry Grayson, little baby Henry. I pray for John and Roseanne Simone, Barbara Simone. I pray for Anthony Scotto and Jim Harmon, Heidi Ignoski and Judge Tony Falanga. I pray for Van Tutwiler and Peggy Maniscalco. I pray for Mom Cecilia Lasanti and for Jose Cruz. I pray for, Aunt, for Leanne Lasanti, for Randy D'Amico, for Ron Citrano and Jim Barr. I pray for Howie Pomerantz. I pray for Sophia Maglione, for Rita Morali. I pray for Jack Carroll, Nancy Lang, Joan Donovan, my friend in Florida, Dean and Mirka McDonald. Pray for Marilyn Arbogast and for Nancy Palumbo and for Pat McTaggart, my friend out in Iowa. I pray for Melissa Bergman and Nick Castellano. I pray for Matthew Edward Lewinsky and Jorge Clemente and Anthony Ponte. I also uh, want to pray as well for all of our public servants uh, who defend us and are there in times of need, especially our firefighters and our police officers. I want to pray for our EMTs. I'm remembering especially Thomas Scanio and Connor Lasanti. I want to pray as well for all of those who serve in the military. I'm remembering especially Sean Dolan, who's been reassigned out to the area around Taiwan in that hot spot in confronting our, uh, our neighbors in China. I want to pray too for many who have died and I've been asked to pray for them and I'd like to do that now. I want to pray for Bill Kelly, for Catherine and William Donovan, Richard Rosmarin, for Billy and Michael Sarasoli. You know, we've been praying for Billy for weeks in the past, and Billy went to God this week after a valiant fight, a wonderful man, a generous soul. Billy's now with his brother, I pray in heaven. Lorraine and Ray Campbell, for John, Maureen, and Ann Raber, for Mary and Ed Raber, for Chuck DeHart, for Joseph Frischia. I want to pray as well for John Slade, for John and Alma Kappa, for my friend Felice Morale. Uh, there's not a priest in West Hempstead who didn't have their, their hair cut by Felice, a wonderful man, fell by that uh, terrible COVID virus. I pray for Michael Manzella and John Neeson, my friend Paul is dead. I pray for Kenny Bolando and Christina Formato and Cynthia Prague. I pray for Gaetano and Sal and Angelo Emilo, for Anthony Preziosi, my good friend, for Pauline Romano, Ed and June Jandovitz, Mary and Charlie Nobile, Linda Nobile O'Brien, Billy Taylor, Robbie Purick, Jimmy Soldo. I pray for Monica Kerrison. I pray for uh, Regina Robinson, Joan and John Donnelly, Henry Meyer, Richard Jackal, Barry Champney, Colin and Tommy Ryan, two brothers who are in heaven together, for Eleanor Mazzi and Brian Hussey, his beautiful daughter Suzanne Scanio, Pray for Mary Rose and John Brosnan, for Ronald Schiappio. I pray for Leon Sherman Jr., for Kate Kelly, Marisa Cole, Connie and Sal Cusimano, Ted Scorsia, Jerry Monk, Vincent Castoria Jr., for Dave Robin and Thomas O'Shea, Matthew Toriello, Marie Austin, beautiful Marie, Vita Palmieri, Emily Lafaso, Kathleen Smith, John Arturi, Raymond Kennedy, Connor and Will Robles, for Marianne Hayes and Tommy Valva, for Pat Cronin, I pray for Tracy Wachowski, Dale Louise Odin. I pray for Joe and Marion Bacigalupo. Let me pray for Elmer Schantz and Alex Haliasos, for Pat Sestar and Marvin Klein, for Peggy Barr, for Jerry and Edward Casal, for Judge Don Belfi, wonderful man, Raymond Hussey, Tina DeBello, my dad Nicholas Lasanti, Joe and Joan Largan, Father Joe Lukaszewski, Ed Almer, Father Ken Marks, Paul Stashut, Father Tim Hurton, Gary and Mike Scorsia, Marilyn Salonia, I pray too as well for Nick Martone and for all young people who have passed. I pray for Constant Polio, for Jerry and Michael Pangallo, Captain Tim Murray and his beautiful wife Erin. I know she has many children to care for now, so we keep her in special prayer at the loss of Tim. Norma Calabrese, Dottie Lauer, Bob Perez, Rose Rosado, John Glauda, Joseph Lovett, Marie Casavecchi, Carolyn Duval, Scotty and Nina Passarelli, Bob and Pat Caliban. I pray for Joe and Peggy Bauman. 
pray for Victor and Lily and Bob and Marge, Tom and Helen, Barlow and Ethel. Let me pray for Edward Riker. I want to pray for Danny Carlson. I want to remember PJ O'Rourke, Evelyn Lalicki, Robert and Joan Cook, Chris Sarrow, for Anna and Peter Canal, and just this past week passing away, uh, my friend Grace Hussey's dad, Frank DiGiorgio. So I pray that Frank is now also on his way to heaven. For all these people who have passed from this life to the next, all the people we love, who we pray are with God in heaven, I want to pray as well for all of our men and women in the armed forces. I want to pray for all those who are battling COVID. I want to pray for those who are trying to cure COVID, especially those who are getting the vaccine out to people who need it. I want to pray for, again, doctors, nurses, EMTs. I want to pray for you and for me and for all of our special and personal intentions. And we're going to take all these intentions and hand them over to the Mother of God. If you'll join me in saying, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Father, the birth of Christ your Son deepened the Virgin Mother's love for you and increased her holiness. May the humanity of Jesus Christ give us all courage in our human weakness. May it freeze, free us from our sins. May it make us a more offering acceptable to you. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. With your Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise and to praise you for your gifts as we contemplate all of your saints, but especially today, Our Lady of Lords. In celebrating the memory of the Blessed Virgin Mary, it is our special joy to echo her song of thanksgiving. What wonders you have worked throughout the world. All generations have shared the greatness of your love, Mary. When you looked on Mary, your lowly servant, you raised her up to be the mother of Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, and then the savior of all humankind. Through Jesus, the angels of heaven offer their prayers of adoration as they rejoice in your presence forever. May our voices now be one with theirs in their triumphant hymn of praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Father, we acknowledge your greatness and all your actions show your wisdom and your love. You formed us in your own likeness and you set us over the whole world to rule over all creatures and to serve you, our creator. And even when we disobeyed you and lost your friendship, 
You did not abandon us to the power of death, but helped all people to seek and to find you. Again and again, you offered a covenant to us and through the prophets taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you so loved the world that in the fullness of time, you sent your only son to be our savior. He was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the blessed Virgin Mary, a man like us in all things but sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, to those in sorrow, joy. In fulfillment of your will, he gave himself up to death, but by rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him, he sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as his first gift to those who believe to complete his work on earth and to bring us all the fullness of grace. Father, may this same Holy Spirit now bless and sanctify these offerings. Let them become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He always loved those who were his own in the world. And when the time came for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, he showed the depth of that love. While they were at supper, Jesus took bread. He blessed the bread and broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness. He gave the chalice to his disciples and friends, and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption. We recall Christ's death, his descent among the dead, his resurrection, and his ascension to your right hand. And looking forward to his coming again in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the acceptable sacrifice which brings salvation to the whole world. Lord, look upon this sacrifice which you have given to your church, and by your Holy Spirit, gather all who share this one bread and one cup into the one body of Christ, a living sacrifice of praise. Lord, remember those for whom we offer the sacrifice, especially Francis our Pope, John our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people everywhere. Remember those who take part in this offering, those here present, and all your people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember those who have died in the peace of Christ and all the dead whose faith is known to you alone. Father, in your mercy grant also to us, your children, to enter into our heavenly inheritance in the company of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, Our Lady of Lourdes, Saint Joseph, her devoted spouse, and all the saints. And then, in your kingdom, freed from the corruption of sin and death, we shall sing your glory with every creature through Christ our Lord, through whom you give us everything that is good. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. pray the Lord's Prayer and when we do let's pray very simply for the ability to recognize that in having a God who's so merciful so loving 
so easily moved to pity for our pain that we in turn should be instruments of his mercy, his love, his generosity to others, that you and I will live simply by the standard of what would Jesus do and do the same. For that to happen in your life and mine, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. And grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. Amen. Our spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Just a couple of announcements, of course, as I mentioned to you before, we will be celebrating Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. And as I mentioned last week, uh, you're welcome to come and receive. We will not be receiving the same way where the priest or deacon might be putting the ashes on your forehead, but rather sprinkling the ashes on top of your head as a way to uh, be blessed with the ashes and at the same time not have physical contact in this age of pandemic. 
So just please feel free to come on Ash Wednesday to church and to join us in celebrating the beginning of Lent. That's one thing I wanted to mention. The other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, once again, tune into Personally Speaking. Just go to YouTube, and it's called Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti. This week we have that wonderful actor Julian Ovenden. But uh, coming up, interesting, Michael Dowling, uh, an immigrant from Ireland who has done great things for health care in our country. He's written a book about what it is to grow up in extreme poverty and to become an immigrant in this country. He's the president of uh, the Northwell Health Industry, which is a huge uh, place uh, not only here on Long Island but around the country in terms of healing people. So he'll be one of our guests, and I wish that you would be with us for that. And then uh, I'd like to also say a word of thanks to all my friends in religious education, uh, so many of the kids who were so good in, in sending me cards that they made themselves for my 40th anniversary of priesthood, ordination to the priesthood. And also this week they sent me and the other priests a number of valentines to say happy valentine's day. I've got one here. Love is patient, love is kind. Happy feast of St. Valentine to Monsignor Lasanti from Cameron Eddings. So Cameron, one of the many kids in religious ed who uh, reminded us that we should celebrate this feast of love. So we say to all the kids in religious ed, thank you, and to their teachers, their catechists, and those who run the program, thank you so much. And then uh, just to all of you, have a great Valentine's Day. What better day to tell people you love, that you love them. Don't miss this opportunity. And for all of you, even if you're not from a parish named Our Lady of Lourdes, celebrate Our Lady coming to us in Lourdes, but especially celebrate St. Bernadette this simple instrument of God's goodness who teaches us all, doesn't matter where we come from, who we are, what we possess, we are precious in God's sight as she was. So with that in mind, let's have our closing prayer. Lord, we rejoice in your sacraments and we ask for your divine mercy as we honor the memory of faith and her love and her dedication. Inspire us to serve you more faithfully by serving others and so work for the salvation of the world. And we ask you to grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And, with your spirit. and may Almighty God bless you and your families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God.